Okay, I think we can start the last session of the workshop. So this session is going to be about applications. And the first talk is on Open Atom, which is one of our largest applications and collaborations uh, between uh, IBM, Yale University, and UIUC. So multiple people will be giving this talk, and we will start with Professor Kelly. Thank you, Milka. I have a short portion to speak about. So uh, Milka mentioned that this is the largest collaboration. It's largest in terms of uh, the current grant. Uh, of course, not in terms of longevity or other, or other things, but we have a uh, fairly large uh, grant from National Science Foundation, uh, SSI SI2 grant that I must acknowledge, acknowledge here for this collaboration. We are in the third year um, of, of, of this grant, and uh, this is a collaboration uh, uh, for this particular grant is between Glenn Martina and uh, uh, Sora Vismayan Beji from Yale, Glenn Martina from IBM Research. Uh, but the uh, original collaboration the, on Open Atom uh, goes back many, many years, 2002 maybe, or a little bit after that, uh, with Glenn when we started developing the Open Atom project. Uh, mainly that was focused on the ground state and based on the Carpernello uh, uh, um, um, algorithm for quantum chemistry or quantum uh, modeling of uh, electronic states. And so uh, the current project is ground and excite and excited uh, electronic state simulations uh, for large systems and large here goes for what goes for large in quantum chemistry, which is a very complex simulation. So it can go as high as say classical MD uh, does, but it aims at very accurate characterization of material uh, properties. Okay, so the goal of this, like I said, project is to accurate, uh, the accurate treatment of uh, complex heterogeneous systems um, and this by accurate we mean quantum mechanical to gain physical insight uh, via novel electronic structure computations. And some of the ex uh, example systems that uh, we're working on are uh, shown here. Um, the specific collaboration funded by Nash, uh, NSF SSI SI2 is for developing a novel methods for new science and technology and this is a collaboration between Glenn Martina uh, Saurabh Ismail Beji and uh, PPL um, uh, to, uh, to develop any uh, e structure capability, electronic structure capabilities for massively parallel platforms. And we are hoping uh, starting this year, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of external interest. We have capabilities that are now uh, at the threshold of uh, uh, more widespread use and more widespread utility. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, so I'm excited about, uh, about this project. At this point, I would like to uh, invite uh, Saurabh to talk about the talk about the GW BSC component of the project. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for putting up with the technology. Um, so I am Saurabh Esmalvegi. I'm talking to you remotely. I'm the person on the left at Yale. Uh, you all know Sanjay at UIUC and Glenn Martina from IBM. Um, we're part of a three uh, institution team. Uh, it's funded by the NSF. It's, the S, it's an SI2 SSI grant. And basically, we're developing electronic softwares, which I'll describe to you in a little bit. Um, this is the Open Atom software package. The moment it does molecular dynamics using density functional theory, and uh, part of the project is to enhance that as well as to add something called GW, which I'll tell you what it is. It uses plane waves, which is a Fourier basis, and pseudopotential, standard stuff. The main thing is that it's extremely well parallelized using Charm++. Uh, the talk I'm going to give is going to be the new part, and later we'll hear about the density functional theory. So I'll be telling you about the GW. Um, what is this density functional theory in terms of what we want to do with it for GW? Um, density functional theory uh, is a theory that lets you understand how int electrons interact with each other and describing the properties of a large number of electrons, which you can't describe directly by solving the Schrodinger equation. It tells you that the energy of the electrons can be described in terms of their density, that's N of R. Um, this energy is written about kinetic, an electron ion, an electron electron interaction to EH term on average, and then some correction called exchange and correlation. In principle, it can give you the exact ground state energy of your system, that is, the lowest energy state of the electrons and where they're distributed on average, the electron density. Um, you minimize this function versus the density to get the optimum. 
And that turns out to be equivalent to solving some self-consistent Schrodinger equations called the Cohn-Sham equations. Um, so this is an equation you've probably seen. It's an eigenvalue equation from standard quantum mechanics. There's some Laplacians for kinetic energy, some potentials, a wave function, and energy, and a wave function. And uh, this VXC thing is the derivative of the other thing called EXC, which is a hard-to-know part. Um, and if you know that, you can solve this equation and get your wave function psi j and their energy epsilon j. So again, every single term in this energy except the last one is completely well determined. And the last one is the part that's hard. It's about electrons interacting with each other, pushing each other out of the way, and then some quantum mechanical effects called exchange, as in Hartree-Fock exchange. And these things are things that we have to approximate, and we shuffled all our ignorance into the small term EXC. Um, so you have to make an approximation to it. There are many approximations. Standard ones go by the names of LDA, Local Density Approximation, and GGA, Generalized Gradient Approximation. They give you excellent geometries, that is where the atoms are, and the total energy is E0. And they give you pretty bad band gaps. That's the energy you have to pay to excite an electron and excitations. And let's so focus on that. So here are three materials. They're all insulators. The band gaps are measured in units called electron volts. Look on the right, you can see they're all positive. The LDA kind of theory gives you these numbers, so there's some qualitative agreement, positive numbers are positive, but the errors are in the order of a half to one or two units of these electron volts. Now, does that matter? Okay, so here's what you would calculate in blue based on this LDA theory would be the optical absorption on the vertical of silicon versus photon frequency. And you see it starts picking up around two electron volts. The black one is the actual experiment. It starts picking up around three electron volts. So what's an electron volt between friends? Well, here's the solar spectrum. Most of the intensity is between two and three electron volts. So if you only had the solar spectrum and no one ever made silicon, so you've done the theoretical calculation, you would have been very happy. You would have said, oh, silicon is a great solar absorber. In fact, it's not a very good solar absorber. It only uh, absorbs photons directly in this, which have very, we have very few of those solar photons. So getting an electron volt off makes a big difference for materials functions. Here are some other examples. Density functional theory, because it has the band gap error, it has problems describing other things. So for example, there's a polymer up here and a nanowire down here, and we want to put excite with the polymer with light and have the electrons jump from the polymer to the nanowire. Whether they jump or not depends on whether the energy levels in the polymer and the zinc and the nanowire are aligned correctly so the electron goes downhill on energy. Or here in a transition metal oxide, we want the electron to go from this atom to that atom. Whether it does that depends on if the energy of where it's going is lower than when it's starting. But the DFT has problems predicting these relative energies. So is any of this real when we use DFT, which is our computational workhorse, to calculate them? So since we're interested in what electrons are doing, the correct thing to do is to go back and ask, what is it we want to know? Well, we want to know about electron propagation. You put an electron here, and it's going to move to over there at a time t, and you want to know about this propagation. Before you transform in space and time, this is momentum and energy. This is his favorite language. And what you find are electron bands. You can add electrons to these bands or remove electrons from those bands, and you want to know these energy momentum dispersion relations. All of this is encoded in something called the Green's function, g. You multiply the wave functions on the top, and there's a little energy denominators here in this function, form of a pole. And this quantity encodes all the propagation par properties of your electrons. Um, what you're supposed to do to get everything here is to solve this thing called the Dyson equation. You see yet another self-consistent eigenvalue problem. And all of these three terms you've seen before are the same as before. And this is the new one. It's called the self-energy, this sigma. And so there's some complications with it. Let me compare it to the density functional theory. Everything's the same except this term has changed into that term. This term is non-local. It's an integral operator. It's not local like this one. And it's energy dependent. This makes it very complicated. And just like VXC, we don't know what these two are in principle, so we approximate. And the GW refers to a formula, not to a person. You multiply the G by something called W to get sigma. That's an approximation that's pretty good, as I'll show you. W is you take the bare Coulomb interaction VC, that's 1 over R, and screen it by a dielectric function. So everything is now mathematically defined. And we'll see how good this theory is. Same materials plus one more, LDA, experiment, and GW. And you can see that GW brings the errors down to a few tenths of an electron volt. It's not perfect, but that's good enough for you know, quantitative materials prediction. 
and you don't have to do insulators, here are the energy versus momentum plots for something like copper. And you can see the dots are the experiments, the solid is the GW, and the dashed is DFT. Here the differences are more muted, but they're real. You can measure them and see them. So this GW stuff seems wonderful. Why are we all using it every day? Um, why don't I use it on my wonderful polymer system? This has about 100 or something atoms per unit cell, per simulation cell. It's not possible to do it with current software routinely. That is, if I wanted to do this with current software, that's available out in the public, I could do it. It would probably use up all my supercomputing time for the entire group just to run one or two iterations of this, which is uh, not where we want to be. Okay, so why is it so expensive? If you do pen and paper scaling, density functional theory scales like the cube of the number of atoms, GW like the fourth. If you want to get the optical excitations, actually there's something else you should do called BSE. That's n to the sixth, but in practice, the scaling is very different from that. You run something that's on the small side of what we'd like to run regularly, say 50 to 75 atoms of something called gallium nitride. I've normalized the DFT to be one CPU hour, and you can see the GW is the real killer. You get the optical spectrum basically for free, even though it's supposed to scale like n to the sixth. So we're just going to focus on GW to get that running. All right, why is it so expensive? So one thing we have to calculate is about how electrons talk to each other. So if you change a potential, at R prime, how much does the electron density change at R? That is, if you tickle the system here, how much does the electron distribution change? This is something you definitely need to know if you want to know how electrons shove each other out of the way. Uh, there's an expression for this. You're supposed to compute this double sum with lots and lots of multiplications. This is from perturbation theory if you're into quantum mechanics. So you have to sum over all the states that are filled with electrons, that's V, and then sum over all the states that are not filled for electrons. In principle, there's infinitely many, but you have to stop somewhere, but you have a lot of them. First, you have to calculate all the states. Then you have to do fast Fourier transforms, since we're going from Fourier basis, to get the size. Then you have to multiply all the size together into a giant matrix. It's a huge outer product. And the matrix P itself is very large, because our grids for R and R prime are quite dense. OK. So what's a typical step you do in a GW calculation? And G0W0 is, for some technical reasons, the exact procedure you're following here, as I'm showing you. There are some small variants, but they all look basically the same. So first you run something called density functional theory to get the energies and wave functions, and you want to correct these. You want to update them. So first you have to compute this P matrix I told you about that's really giant and difficult to calculate. Then you have FFD the rows and columns. Basically you change from R space to what we call G space. These are momentum vectors or Fourier vectors. Once you have that, you do some in-place multiplies to get another matrix of the same size as P called epsilon. You have to invert that. That's a large inversion. Once you have that, you can make the electrons have dynamic screening. So there's some recipes you follow. It's called the plasmon pole. And once you have that, you put together your energy eigenvalues from DFD, your wave functions, and this epsilon inverse, and you form sigma. And you use that to correct. The most expensive part is the calculation of P. And so we're going to focus on that. Um, in R space and G space. We've decided to do things in R space. I want to show you a little bit about what's different about it. So in G space, you must calculate the expression here, but I've written it down. It's the same thing, just written in a different way. To calculate these numbers here, you have to multiply a pair of states and then do an FFD. So that's an awful lot of FFDs, OK? You have to do as many as there's pairs of states. Once you've done that, you still have to do an outer product, which is the number of Vs and Cs and the G squared. So that's order n to the fourth. You do the side to two things in R space like you originally wrote. OK, you still have to do the giant multiplications of order n to the fourth. You can't get away from that when you write it this way. But uh, once you build it, the number of FFTs is much smaller. You just have FFT the rows and columns that's linear in the system size. So uh, we save on FFTs, and we still have to slave away on the big matrix multiplication. So Eric now is going to take over and tell you about how this giant matrix multiplication is parallelized. So I'll talk about the parallel implementation of pretty much uh, the majority of the algorithm that Saurabh just described. Um, so, so far, uh, on the UIUC side, we've completed most of the algorithm up to the self-energy computation, uh, sparing a little bit of verification. And we still need to do some larger runs for scaling of some of the later components. Um, but we've completed uh, the large steps of the algorithm. Um, so as Saurabh mentioned, these are really large data structures we're working with. Um, and so memory is one of the primary constraints that we had to focus on. And again, as Sarv also mentioned, formation of P is the most costly step. Uh, so just as a refresher, the basic computation we're doing to form P 
uh, we have uh, a bunch of state vectors, which we refer to as psi. Um, and we take all the psi LM pairs for all L and M, where L are occupied states and M are unoccupied states. Uh, and we do a, a element-wise multiplication to get FLM. And then for all of these Fs, we do the outer product and sum together, and that gets us our P. Um, so in terms of the memory concerns, what is a typical problem or a, a, a larger problem going to look like in this domain? Uh, so here are some example numbers we came up with sort of early on, uh, what we expect some of the larger problems we want to solve to look like. We'd be looking at around one megabyte per state with 10,000 total states per K point, uh, where 1,000 of those approximately would be occupied and the other 9,000 would be unoccupied. We'd have around 10 K points, so we have 100 gigabytes to store all of the states which is uh, reasonable. However, then P itself is a terabyte of space to store. And the F vectors that we have to compute are there's going to be around 90 million of those because we have 1,000 uh, times 9,000 pairs of states per 10 K points. And that's around 90 terabytes of memory that we have to store at, uh, at least somewhat um, at some point in time. So we need to figure out how to manage this computation and, and all the memory. Uh, so the first I'll talk about the parallel decomposition. So we have our two primary pieces of data we'll be working with are the psi vectors and the P matrix that we're going to be forming. Uh, so we have L occupied psi vectors and M unoccupied psi vectors with R elements in real space. Uh, that part's pretty straightforward. We're just going to put one state in each element of a 1D char array. Um, and then the runtime system will distribute that um, across our, our nodes. Um, for the P matrix, we're going to decompose it into tiles, and then each tile is going to be put into a 2D char array element, um, and again, map to the nodes. Um, and so now looking at how the actual computation will, will flow, the first thing we want to do is take all of our occupied states and actually duplicate them across every node in a node level cache uh, using a node group in Charm++ to do so. Um, and we'll refer to this as the psi cache from, from here on out. Um, so once every node has all of the occupied states, uh, we can then start actually broadcasting one at a time our unoccupied states to every node to compute our uh, start computing our set of f vectors. So we'll pick uh, an unoccupied state, broadcast it out to all the psi caches, and upon receiving it, each psi cache will then uh, do the computation to form all of the, the entire set of f vectors associated with that unoccupied state, um, and it'll store that in the psi cache, which is accessible to every uh, char on that node. And once we have this set of Fs, now all of the matrix tiles that exist on that node can then read from this F cache and uh, perform the outer product and update its own tile. Uh, and then we just repeat step two for the next unoccupied state and go through this entire process until every unoccupied state has met every occupied state and we have our uh, final P matrix. <coughs> so. Here's some initial scaling results. This is a comparison against the Berkeley GW code, which is another parallel implementation of uh, the uh, GW algorithm. This one is for a 54 atom uh, silicon data set, so it's still a bit smaller than um, what we hope to eventually reach in terms of data set sizes. Here we're looking at about a tenth of a megabyte per state with uh, 100 occupied and 1,000 unoccupied states. Uh, this one was only on 1K point. Um, and this is using 32 processors per node on Vesta. And so here we see the, the total time uh, against the number of nodes. And we see that the open atom, here we have the three lower uh, curves are open atom with different levels of over decomposition. And we saw that for the most part, uh, the finest decomposition, uh, which is there in the uh, yellow, sorry. The yellow is what performs the best as we scale out. Um, and the Berkeley GW stops scaling around 128 nodes, whereas the open atom uh, continues to keep scaling up until around 1,000 nodes. And at that point, we're starting to kind of run out of P matrix to even split up across the nodes. Uh, we have um, another uh, set from a slightly larger data set. So this is twice the atoms and approximately twice the amount of memory per state. Uh, again, of silicon and just another scaling result where the open atom, again, scales pretty well out to 1,000 nodes uh, run on Vesta. Um, so then for the later parts that Sarb also mentioned, um, we have those completed as well. However, uh, like he said, the P formation is by far the largest part of the computation. And just to get an idea of actually how large, uh, when we looked 
uh, at, for example, the 128 node run, we are taking about 20 seconds uh, to do setup, which is reading in all the states, uh, FFTing the states to uh, real space, and uh, duplicating the states across our node level caches, then about 800 seconds to actually form P, and then the rest of the computation that follows, which I'll describe, took about two total seconds. So the P is by far the largest bottleneck. Um, the later steps, FFTing G P to G space is fairly straightforward. We just convert, uh, convert our P matrix to a 1D decomposition, um, and then we have each row locally. Uh, we can FFT it using the FFTW library. Uh, transpose that, making sure not to blow up the messaging layer with too many messages. FFT each row again, and then transpose and convert back to the 2D uh, decomposition for the next phase, which is the epsilon inverse. So this is where we take epsilon, which is just the uh, scaled and cutoff version of P, and do an iterative inverse on epsilon. Uh, so this is going to use the existing open atom matrix matrix multiply library, which has actually existed from the ground state side of open atom for a while now. Um, and so basically we start off with X and we iterate um, multipl doing multiplications until we end up with uh, the inverse of psi, or sorry, epsilon. And the epsilon size in this case is reduced by around 10X from P because of the cutoff. So one potential scaling problem, or at least a, a bottleneck we see is that even when we're running at very large scales and we have enough, no or enough work to fill up all the nodes and we have a very large P matrix, once we cut down to this smaller uh, matrix there's not exactly a lot of work left to do, and it's harder to spread it across the nodes. Um, and then the last step, which is the part that we just recently finished and we're still verifying, is the self-energy calculation. Um, so these are similar operations to what it was to form P, where we're um, basically doing multiplications on pairs of F and NL. So this time, instead of an occupied state paired with uh, an unoccupied state, it's an occupied state paired with the nth state, where n is just an input set of state indices, and these indices can be either occupied or unoccupied. Um, and then this is there's two components to this, the bare exchange and screen exchange. Both form the same general pattern of uh, f of nl multiplied by some matrix multiplied by the transpose of f nl for all nl, where the n's don't necessarily have to match, so we do it against all pairs in the set. Uh, for screened exchange, that a matrix in the middle is epsilon. For bare exchange, uh, it's just the uh, bare Coulomb interaction. Um, and so one thing that's interesting here is that the bare Coulomb interaction, the VG, uh, we actually have that from the very beginning of the computation. So hypothetically, we can actually start the bare exchange as soon as we start receiving these pairs. So that's something we're going to think about for future implementations. Um, but basically, the only thing that needed to be added to the existing framework to get this to work was we extended the F cache to cache portions of F vectors during P calculation. So as we were forming these F vectors, we were checking to see if they matched any of the N indices that were passed in, and we were going to store them. However, um, because now instead of having um, pairs meet where one pair comes from the occupied set and one pair comes from the unoccupied set, now that all the pairs come from the same set, if we were to store entire F vectors, we wouldn't have enough space on a node to store all of them. So we have to store them distributed, which would require computation when we need the pairs to meet. And it turns out getting all of the pairs in a set to meet and figuring out the least amount of communication to do so is not exactly a trivial problem. So we decided instead, if we map the tiles of our matrix smartly so that we have contiguous blocks of tiles on each node, we don't actually need the entire F vector to update a tile of, uh, of a matrix in that case. So we can store just portions of the F vector saving us a lot of space, and meaning that for this step, there's basically no communication until at the end you do your sum reduction to get the uh, final result. Um, so some future optimizations that we already have in mind for hopefully making this even faster and more scalable. Uh, in the very first step, when we're broadcasting out our unoccupied states to form P, we want to do more than one at a time, so pipeline that. So as you're working on one, you already have the next one coming, and you can store a bunch of them at a time. Uh, pending memory requirements. Uh, smarter node level cache layout storage, or storage layout. Um, so like I mentioned, for the, the later steps, we realized we could just store portions of F. We can probably do a similar optimization of storing just portions of the occupied states and portions of those F vectors as well, as long as we have a smart mapping of the P matrix tiles. Um, and dynamic creation and deletion of matrices will help us save on memory instead of creating all of the space we need uh, and allocating it all up front if we do it dynamically as we go. We can save memory for the earlier phases where 
getting more work on a node to be able to go through that uh, without um, waiting for communication may help improve the um, uh, speed of the first step. GPGPU work, so uh, I think in one of the earlier talks this week, or maybe in the next portion of this talk, uh, GPGPUs have already been somewhat, uh, started to be integrated into OpenAtom for BLAST operations, and we have a bunch of those in the GW as well. So more opportunities for GPGPU usage. And again, overlapping phases where possible. We saw that, for example, the bear exchange doesn't need to wait for all of the first three steps to complete. So perhaps uh, when we shrink down the matrix and we have this small epsilon matrix and we don't have enough work to feed all the processors, well now maybe we can um, have some of the processors working on the epsilon inverse and other processors working on the bear exchange and get a little better uh, layout there. Um, so now, back to Thor. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, it's very good to hear from the people who actually do the work rather than the higher level talking heads. Anyway, so I'm back uh, just for a few brief comments. Um, so um, again, I'm going to, this is the same data that Eric showed and I want to tell you what it means to us. Um, so let's, for example, focus on this plot here as users um, and first time really charm parallel users. So uh, the Berkeley GW code here, BGW, um, this was a code that as a postdoc in the early 2000s, I helped partly parallelize and improve it and take the scaling from n to the fifth to n to the fourth, in fact. Um, so I haven't in something invested in this curve, but this is uh, an MPI code that's parallelized by hand, all right? So you can see it's got very good scaling for a while on a fixed problem side, and then you see the bowing here on this plot. It starts to peter out. Um, it, where it peters out, of course, depends on the system size. A 100 atom silicon cell is not huge, but it is representative of the kind of thing we want to run routinely. And one of the wonderful things about the charm that we've uh, learned, and you can see it right here, is that the scaling is fantastic. You can keep cranking on this thing and increase the number of processors or nodes, and your time to solution drops. And because it's linear, you're not wasting CPU time. So two things, time to solution drops and it scales correctly. Uh, so we're very excited to uh, put this code as is to use. Um, and so where are we right now? Uh, so what, the way the modus operandi is we develop methods in serial, then we talk to the folks at UIUC, and what we discuss for three months the data structures and then we implement. So the computation of P, the FFTs to, from P columns and rows, inversion of epsilon, all done in parallel. Uh, we've implemented serial for the plasmon pole and uh, simplified self-energy. Those two are in progress for the parallel. And for the a fancy self-energy, that's in progress right now uh, on, in the serial code. And uh, in the future, near future, we'll be doing that in parallel. So our aim is that sometime early this summer, up to slice step number five, we'll make a public release. And that will be a well-scaling GW code with a very decent description of the self-energy. Um, up to now, you've heard of uh, very good parallelization of standard methodology for GW. And now Min Jung Kim, a postdoc, will tell you about how to do the calculation better so the scaling is reduced. So, um... I'm going to explain our new static polarizability matrix uh, method. So even though we employed uh, our space representation of the polarizability, it still scales like n to the fourth. So uh, our goal is to make a new algorithm so that it, this matrix calculation scales like cubic. It's an, not really new. Um, the cubic scaling algorithm is, has been out there but we wanted to take advantage of our real space representation of the polarizability matrix. So we came up with two different ideas. First, interpolation. Um, so this is again the polarizability matrix which scales like n to the fourth. And what we want to do is to um, set the function A which resembles to um, this part. And the polarizability matrix can be written with um, this function A. Then what we are going to do is to calculate this A matrix uh, and save the values over some Z grid. Then we interpol once we actually need this A function to, uh, of um, the energy 
uh, valencement energy, we interpolate by using already saved number. Uh, then the computation for this A matrix would be an R square and C and, and Z. And for the interpolation, it will be an R square and V and an int. And int is the number of points for the interpolation. So if the number of Z is much smaller than the valence band, number of valence bands, then it will scale like n to the third. And for this part, uh, we uh, found that the linear interpolation just works well. So this n int would be just two. So this is nothing. Um, so uh, we achieved the n to the cubic um, polarizability matrix calculation by using interpolation. And the second method um, we, uh, we explored is Laplace method. So this is the Laplace identity, one over EC minus EV can be written by using this integral. And um, it can also use Gauss Laguerre quadrature for this integration that it is approximated by um, the summation of um, so Gauss Laguerre quadrature node and weight. Um, this WK is weight and XK is node. Then this one over EC minus EV will be approximated like that. Then our polarizability matrix, one over EC minus EV can be substituted by um, this formula. Then our polarizability matrix have three parts. First one is um, the quadrature and the conduction band and the valence band part. So previously it wasn't separable. So it's uh, n to the fourth. But now these two um, summation is separate, separable. So the number of computation by employing this Laplace method would be nr square and gl and c plus nv. Um, but the number of quadrature node does not depend on the system size. So this one would be almost uh, constant even though we increase the system size. So it will scale like um, the cubic. Furthermore, we can save um, computation by implementing um, windowing strategy. So our observation is the number of quadrature nodes only depends on the bandwidth uh, and the band gap ratio. So um, the polarizability matrix can be um, calculated by some some by um, using um, different part of the inter interband transition. Uh, I'm explaining uh, with the example, like two by two window. Um, so the polarizability matrix can be calculated by this. So this is the energy landscape. There are um, valence band energy and the conduction band energy. Then our polarizability matrix is uh, the summation of P11, which is the interband between EV1 and EC1, and P21, which is calculated by these two window, and um, P12 is calculated by these two window and P22 is calculated by these two window. So by um, using this windowing strategy, we can save lots of computational cost and it'd be especially useful for materials with a smaller band gap because if the band gap is small, then the number of quadrature uh, nodes would be uh, large. Um, then we want to estimate the computational cost before we actually set any, any windows. So again, the number, to, number of quadrature node depends on the E-band gap, uh, E-band width over E-band gap. Then um, this is the actual, uh, the circles are actual number of nodes. And I uh, made a plot with respect to the E-band width over the band gap. And this red dashed line is um, uh, square root um, E bandwidth over E gap. So the number of quadrature nodes can be approximated by square root of um, this ratio. And also this NC plus NV uh, can be approximated by the um, energy band, uh, the bandwidth minus E gap. Um, we, if we assume uh, the flat density of states, so what I wanted to um, explain here is the computational cost for the windowing can be estimated by the number of band, uh, the energy of bandwidth and the energy gap. So um, how good is this estimation? I, I'm going to show on uh, the example of again, two by two window. So the system that, that I explored is 
uh, has a two heart tree of the band bandwidth and 0 0.02 heart tree for the band gap. And uh, I'm uh, I uh, explored um, the number of computations by using these two variables, which is just a ratio of um, the the windows energy windows. So the left figure is the real computational cost. I don't there's I, I'm not sure why the axis is not showing here, <laughs> um, but uh, this axis is the EV ratio, like this, and here is the EC ratio, like that, and the uh, Z axis is the actual number of costs. And our estimation um, is very similar to the real computational cost. So um, I would say this uh, simple cost estimating function works very well. Then next, how many windows for occupied and unoccupied states are required? To do that, uh, I also ex I again explore, explored with um, um, the system with um, these energy values, and the x axis is um, the number of windows for conduction band, and y axis is the number of valence band uh, number of windows for the valence band, and as you can see here, uh, I explored all all the costs for each um, number of windows, then we finally can. Um, choose the optimized number of windows. For this example, the number of uh, windows for valence band is one, uh, number of windows for the conduction band is four. So we can do all, all do this before the any uh, actual peak calculations. So this is the result um, by using our uh, cubic scaling polarizability matrix method. Uh, I used the silicon crystal with 16 atoms and the number of bands are 433, and number of windows are one for valence and four for the conduction band. And this is a dielectric constant, and the interpolation and Laplace method shows very similar trend, but the actual winner is Laplace plus windowing. As you can see here, the error um, reduces significantly, um, very rapidly. So um, the Laplace method with windows seems to win a lot. Um, the reason why we are doing the GW calculation is actually to find the band gap. So um, I uh, also um, comp computed the band gap of the system by using our steady COSEX um, um, serial code. Um, so again, the interpolation is blue and the Laplace plus window is uh, red, uh, red triangles. And as you can see here, only 5% of computation, we can um, get the error of only 0 0.02 electron volt, which um, is very, um, which I would say very accurate for the GW calculation. And we also wanted to see if it scales as it, it, it should be. So I explored it with um, the silicon crystal with two, four, eight, and 16 atoms. And uh, the y-axis of this graph is the compute time per operation. And I calculated this value using um, these equations. And the n to the fourth method is very flat, which means it scales as uh, n to the fourth. For the Laplace plus windowing, um, for small system, it takes a little bit longer time. But once the system size increases, um, it scales as it should, so it's almost nearly flat. So uh, we wanted to uh, implement this uh, new uh, algorithm, which uh, especially the Laplace plus windowing to our um, open atom software so that we can actually um, make a very rapid GTOP calculation. Thank you very much. So as Sanjay introduced to you, we're really interested in calculating the electronic structure of a large complex systems on parallel platforms. And today I'm going to introduce to you another implementation we developed recently to help with that course. So here's a little background of uh DFT for those the non, non experts. So if you consider that you want to calculate the electronic structure of a Many of a system with many atoms and all the uh, electrons spinning around them. You are dealing with a overwhelmingly complex system. And to so to solve that, Dr. Kong, um, he invented the Kongxiang DFT and turned that many more problem to a one body problem. And the real, the only unknown is the local density. You can and he 
can just decompose this class by a series of conjunct states orthogonal to each other. Number of conjunct states is the number of electrons divided by two. Each state can accommodate two electrons. And once you have the density, every energy term is a functional of that density, and um, you can split the total energy to the uh, uh, kinetic energy, R3 external exchange correlation. These first three are crystal clear to physicists, and the last one is a bit more um, mysterious, and people have developed left developed different methods to calculate it. And here we are going to adopt this uh, generalized gradient approximation, which calculates the exchange correlation energy based on the local density and its gradient. And uh, currently, Kongshan GFT is already implemented in uh, OpenAtom, and um, we feel really good we, because we have better math. Also, we use term plus plus. As you can see here, it, it looks like it's just going to keep scaling no matter how many cores it is through to the software. We also uh, realized many good uh, features like k-point scattering for things and excitation, excitation, uh, excited, excited, excited states calculations as we introduced uh, earlier in this talk. Um, there's one problem though. So we are. We are currently using the so-called non-conserving pseudo potential, which requires a large basis fit, which is a large number of time waves to simulate your Kongxian uh, states. Which is, so this is a uh, uh, memory demanding, also it makes your calculations slower. To solve that problem, we consider using the projector augmented wave method. So it, it, allows us, it allows us to use a smaller basis um, by splitting the total Kongxian state into a uh, localized part and the delocalized part. And uh, the other good thing about Po is that it has uh, direct access to the core state, so you can get the information of the core state when needed. And the bad thing is that uh, it doesn't scale very well, also, the parallel performance is quite poor. So our goal here is to implement N square mode M, ES based uh, Po with a good parallel performance for Open Atom. Uh, this is a little background for Paul. So uh, you split this conscient state by uh, into this small part and the core part, which has contribution from every atom in your system. The core part, uh, of course, it lives only inside the core, which is a augmentation region uh, with a radius of RPC. The small part, we can treat it like in the um, standard DFT way. We do a plane wave uh, expansion. Core part is a bit more complex. It, we can construct it by these two uh, um, projectors. And so we first construct the uh, Z matrices. Uh, it has the size of the number of uh, conjunct states times the number of atoms in your system. And after that, you multiply Z matrices by the other uh, projector delta P. And remember, delta P and PS, they both live in the so this is a little illustration. Each core, each sphere is one of your atoms, and around it is the core part um, wave function. And uh, the smooth part wave function lives in the whole simulation box. And the tricky thing is that uh, um, every core it interacts with each other, also it, it interacts with the smooth part. So we will develop uh, methods to deal with that. Um, so again, these are the four parts of the total energy. So if you consider the kinetic energy, you apply the kinetic energy operator to the uh, Kongxiang, um, uh, PSW uh, Kongxiang states, which has a smooth part and a core part. You, you end up with getting three different terms, the smooth smooth interaction, which we denote as X, and a core core, which we denote as core 2, and the cross term, the core smooth interaction, which we denote as uh, core 1. And to calculate the exchange correlation energy, you need to know the densities, the smooth density, of course, also the density around each core, like the core densities, which has three different parts. So for the uh, uh, part three and the external energies, because there's no na natural truncation scale for this uh, one of our terms, we need to use additional trick, which is the uh, evil decomposition. So we split up the uh, total energy into a short range part and long range part. They, we solve the long range part in the G space using Poisson summation. And you can see that there, uh, we can get this uh, exponential term which truncates our G space. 
and saves us. For the short range uh, part though, we solve it in the real space, it's truncated by this A earth C term, and we need to know the, uh, uh, the, uh, the densities as we did for the exchange correlation part. So this is to show you how good uh, our truncation term, the exponential term is in the previous slide. So as you can see, we can get good accuracy with uh, both small RC and small uh, GC, which is our goal. So here is the uh, two main uh, theories that based on which we construct our implementation. So the first one is a sampling theory. So if you have a FFT from uh, the real space as far to the G space, uh, I want to calculate the Fourier coefficients for uh, fr to its nth power, and I can do it exactly by sampling fr onto a n times tensor grid. And for example, if I if I know the uh, psi and I want to calculate the density, uh, in this case m is just equals two, and I just use a twice as dense uh, sampling in the real space, and I can solve for the density in the g space exactly in order n of n. The second one is uh, ES, zero exponential spline. And if, what, if you want to calculate the Z matrices, the structure factor, and all the core densities, you pretty much every time you see this uh, exponential, complex ex exponential term, and this R just um, depicts uh, where your atom lives, and they, they can live anywhere in the simulation box. They don't have to land on those uh, regular FFT grids, which is a bad thing, so we, use the, this ES to interpolate this term onto the regular equally sized uh, FFT grid. And uh, this, this is a weight factor which enables the ES. And this S, uh, the real space S here, is uh, the FFT grid. And the good thing about it is the, the MP has a compact support. So as you can see here, there are only a finite number of non-zero terms. The error term here is 2g divided by n FFT, so which dictates us to use a slightly denser um, uh, FFT grid to control the error. So, so we end up with having three different FFT uh, grids, the density grid. So where here, the, this, for the sampling theory, n equals 2, and the, the psi ES and the density ES grid. So, so the first one, so is to illustrate you, so um, I have this uh, um, psi g in the uh, psi ES grid, and I can multiply that by the uh, weight factor, which enables the ES. And I do the FFP and get the uh, weighted um, uh, function state in the real space. And, and here, I do the same thing for the density. And in the middle, it's, it, uh, it's just uh, how we calculate the uh, uh, g space density. So also, this is show you how we do the uh, ES. So think that we have a real space function, small function, which lives um, in this whole box. And these uh, little dots are your FFT grids. And it interacts, it gets interacted with uh, every atom in your system. So we use ES and we can get the non-zero points on the regular FFT grid. There are there are only a finite number of them for each one for each uh, atom, and these uh, little boxes can overlap. There is no problem, and uh, we can do this on the psi ES. I can do it for the for the density, and sometimes you are not not only interested in the uh, in the center of the atom position. We 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 want to do numeric integration, and we apply uh, uh, another real space fine grid um, RF. So we end up with getting like a bigger uh, little <laughs> a box, uh, but it's okay because uh, all these, uh, the number of uh, these non-zero points and the number of the F grid, it doesn't scale with the system size. So uh, to show you uh, how we do this, I'll just do an example to save time. And uh, this is really a, a, a real space, a real space density on the fine RF grid. So I'll pick this one for example. So you start from the ES weighted density in the G space, which is uh, DG times uh, the density in the G space, and you and you do a FFT and get the real space thing. And for each atom, you do, you use ES, and you find 
this uh, number of points for each atom. And from there, you can do the display and uh, calculate the E as interpolated so density around each day. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so, in the end, I'm going to show you with uh, an application we want to simulate. So, so nowadays, every, the material science people, everybody's talking about it. this rock sky solar cell. Uh, this is a structure about it. The good thing about this material is uh, it has a very high efficiency and it uh, has a low cost and you can tune its band gap and makes it flexible for different applications. The bad thing is that the, the material is unstable under pretty much any environment. So we want to uh, do some simulations with just a large system. It has uh, over 500 atoms. Um, it's a large system for, for, for initial calculations. And uh, um, also we want to search for like substitutional elements for lead and uh, which makes PAW plays a really important role here which makes your calculations efficient. Also we want to design new interfaces in terms of encapsulation methods to, to prevent the material from degrading. Um, uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. One more segment. Okay, we're, we're, we ran a little long, so but I'm going to speed through some slides. <clears throat> there we go. So <clears throat> we keep the repository uh, in, in, our, in, a, in our own uh, Git repository, and we try to make sure that the software remains robust by doing automated testing, um, which I described here, uh, and continuous integration testing uh, combined with charms. So that changes the charm, uh, our testing against open atom, so we, we don't mysteriously break it. So <clears throat> here's a quick summary of the, the main features that uh, we are supporting. Um, uh, the left side has the names and uh, the, the various kinds of minimization versus dynamics components associated with them. And the right side has the level of testing automation associated with each of these features. Uh, we're still automating a few of these, uh, and the band generation is still under evaluation, but we're making pretty decent progress overall in uh, supporting the, the main goals of the project at the beginning for the early years. The, uh, from the Computer science perspective, uh, all this DFT is uh, essentially a massive flows of data through a variety of different uh, matrices. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this graph, but the main idea here is that we, we have the states. From the states, we compute the density. After we've used electron density to update the cone sham potential, we update that out to transform the states integrate those forces onto the atoms and the particles, and then apply orthonormalization constraint and go to the next time step. Each of these being separate char arrays in each case with different dimensions depending on the quantities of data involved. So one of the uh, important things that we uh, have, have done recently is do some comparison with uh, a code that has a similar set of features uh, this is a, a single instance test of water 32 with uh, a tiny cutoff of uh, 10 Renbergs. This is a, just a simple benchmark system, so our, our scaling is pretty good. As we move up to uh, larger water systems, uh, we continue to, uh, to improve and scale out, uh, and the formation of Qbox is not scaling as well for this. Um, and as we move up to the larger system, we continue to perform fairly well, which is, is why our, our collaborators continue to move forward with this code as they want to get the best time per step for their computations available. <coughs> the, uh, in, the, in the past, we've done a lot of work on object placement to minimize the total cost of communication. Um, the upshot of that comes in this graph where we find that with having mapped our objects based on the topology of the network, we can significantly reduce the total cost of communication, which can improve the time step by 20% uh, on Blue Gene Q and uh, actually even more on other network architectures. 
Well, recently we've been expanding the support to a variety of what we call these multi instance methods. Um, and the uh, <clears throat> basic idea is that we take the, the existing instance, that, that flow I showed earlier, and we reproduce that for the number of replicas that are necessary for each of these models. So in the, in the spin orbitals case, uh, they, uh, they share some of the components, but do an exchange for the density where there's an up version and a down version. For K points, uh, we replicated many of the data segments, but everything shares the same density. So for the every time we are computing that, we have to combine the results from across all of the bands of K points that are defined. And for path integrals, everything is replicated, but the actual atom integration has to go through this additional inner polymer force evaluation phase. And for temperature exchange, uh, everything is replicated and they operate entirely independently until a temperature exchange step is triggered, at which point there is a, a shuffle of temperatures uh, and uh, the appropriate conversion of data across the temperatures and then they lose it. Uh, performance. This is one of the things that I'm targeting. I don't have new results on this, but I'm almost certain I know exactly what this problem is. That's basically due to the fact that the communication here needs to be more carefully partitioned within each instance. We're doing more communication than we need to do to get the correct results, and that is actually causing this sort of cross instance interference that is degrading our strong scaling performance and, more importantly, the weak scaling performance here. Uh, we can combine these together uh, so you can run. Uh, path integrals and tempers at the same time, um, and here the performance limitation is essentially from the same problem previously described. <clears throat> For uh, GP GPUs, uh, Michael Robson had a presentation uh, earlier, uh, yesterday, which uh, described that this in more detail. Here I'm, I'm reproducing the result uh, just to, as a quick summary. So here's the non-accelerated version, and then uh, when we offload the pair calculators, uh, the two sides of the organization get faster. Um, and so this is a, a good, attractive beginning to this process. And the next operation for GPU is going to be to accelerate even more phases of the computation. Finally, our more recent work is on adding the uh, plane augmented wave parallelization, um, as described by Chi. And so what we've been looking at is uh, how the formulation that they've described is going to, to actually be implemented. And the smooth components essentially use the existing code. Um, and we have, there's only one addition there. Uh, the core components are, uh, are mostly implemented using the EES FFT formulation that we already have. So we can reproduce, we can essentially reuse our existing schemes for that. But the new challenges are going to be to effectively overlap the smooth and the core operations within the constraints of the dependencies that they have on each other uh, and manage the amount of parallelism that is available to us across these sort of new operations, right? Essentially, the, as, or, as we're constructing the, uh, the core contributions, uh, they are mutually independent until you do the core by core operation. Um, and so we need to make sure that for larger systems, uh, we schedule those appropriately. Um, here's a high level kind of a perspective on that. Um, <clears throat> The key here is uh, this is basically taking the, the middle chunk of our diagram, uh, where we do the density and the non-local, and massively expanding the portion of the time step that's going to be consumed by this operation. Uh, so we're going to be designing these to be make sure that that is both efficient and does not blow up memory um, for some larger uh, scale systems with many atom types and many channels. So future work uh, is actually implementing the PAW as described, um, improving the section, sectionized, partitionized communication for the instances, uh, finishing the band generation to be complete and verified, um, improving heuristics for default decomposition parameter choices. This is something our collaborators particularly love as they don't really enjoy thinking through how to, how, how to chunk up the problem. Um, and a lot of this can be automatically determined at launch time. Uh, there's a fast Hartree Flock implementation that we're interested in doing. And finally, uh, 
we have developed an abstraction for uh, Fourier transforms in 3D with spherical cutoff, which we use in electron density phase, and we're going to be expanding that to use in every part of the FFT, and we're going to make sure that that work can be offloaded to accelerators when they're present. Thank you.